Well, thank you, Jacob. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to participate. I think that after Dr. Jeffrey Sachs' conference, there's very little to add. But since I was in the program, I have to add something, okay? Uh, and I, I'm going to touch, hopefully, in my allotted time, that is about 15 minutes, I guess. Thank you. Uh, on six points, so that's two points a minute. Uh, first, I think it, it, it was not only a pleasure, but an honor to listen to Jeffrey, because his view is a global view. And I think that one of the things we're missing in dealing with policy is instead of details, produce global views that could be translated in a language such as that that not only politicians understand, because that should be one of our focus, but the other stakeholders, like the people that are suffering from climate change, that are suffering from poverty, and that are our natural allies in this fight, global fight for sustainability. The only two points I, I want to add to the magnificent presentation is that the, in the Africa case, there's an added problem, a part of the population explosion. The shape of the age pyramid is not supposed to change in the next 40 years. And that's another problem which is different from the growth, but can determine the pathway and can probably be one of the added causes for instability in the region. I think that the both problems are different and should be tackled by the world together. The other point I want to add is the example of Brazil. I think that Brazil has been looked, was looked about probably six years ago as a very peculiar country that had about 60 or 70 percent of the energy from renewable sources. And there was a global discussion whether our way of dealing with energy was opposed or not to a way of dealing for food. Land use was a big problem eight years ago. There was intense discussion, especially coming from the States and Europe, affirming that our model for sustainable growth was impossible because it placed food production in conflict with energy production with bioenergy. I think that that problem doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Scope and Brazil have just had a very wonderful meeting uh, a couple of months ago, and the document was very clear. Properly managed from the policy and economic point of view, there's no, no contradiction between land for food and land for bioenergy. Uh, I'm, no, I'm not going to, to go over the details, but that was the main message given by scientists all over the world, that we don't have to worry too much when you get ethanol from corn, because it just doesn't make sense. But there are other ways of doing it, and now the second generation ethanol and bioenergy production is perfectly possible. So those are the two comments I wanted to add to the magnificent presentation of uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. The second point I want to make has been made by Mike Legg. Mike and I have worked together for the last, I don't know how many years, so I, I, I'm going to repeat something of what you said, but it's okay. Uh, I think that we have seen and listened a lot about technology. I want to emphasize that 
more fundamental science is needed in order to face problems that are extremely complex and that are only solved by the present technologies to a very limited extent. And I'm going to give you three examples. One, the CO2 problem. We are thinking inside the box in terms of CO2 sequestration. Uh, new science is needed because it, lo and behold, I'm just a simple chemist, but I can tell you that we don't understand completely how does CO2 hydrate. Very simple problem. If we don't understand how CO2 hydrates, perhaps we'll be using in-the-box technology thinking to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And mind you, if we don't decrease the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the future generations may be doomed. It's not a question only of decreasing emission, but it's a question of decreasing the concentration of CO2 presently in the atmosphere that has reached the numbers that were shown and are absolutely, absolutely unsustainable. The other, the other example is uh, what was mentioned, the rise, the explosive rise of the cellular phone that makes all of us happy. Without quantum mechanics, uh, that was discovered in the early 1900s, there wouldn't be a, any GPS possible. Uh, of course, Einstein and colleagues and Dirac and company were not thinking of the uh, cellular phone. But it would be quite difficult, uh, if not impossible, to have the cellular phone system without understanding the quantum mechanics behind it and the problem of having a GPS, which, by the way, is a total mystery to humanity, with very few exceptions. And the DNA sequencing is another example. If you look at it carefully, why has the price decreased by orders of magnitude in such a short time? It's, it, the answer is extremely simple. New chemistry. Uh, it's, it's the new chemistry that has allowed different types of sequencing and probably we will get another factor of 100 in, in a couple of months from now uh, with, uh, well, I'm not going to go into details, but that is going to go even further down. So it's expected in about five years that cost will be down to about 100 bucks. Um, so, so more fundamental science is absolutely essential because present technology can only solve a limited amount of problems. Now we come to the third point, which is probably one of the most difficult questions that we scientists face. And that is, how do we integrate science technology, policy, and stakeholder interests. We have been extremely effective, increasingly so, to integrate science and technology. Uh, whether it's pull or push, anyway, this thing is coming very fast. And even cultures that were totally used to separate science from technology and live in an ivory tower. I've never seen an ivory tower, but anyway, live in an ivory tower, are breaking those bonds, those uh, uh, frontiers, and the integration of science and technology is now a reality essentially everywhere in the world. Linking those two things to policy is something totally different, and it's even more difficult to link science, technology, policy and define stakeholders. Because as long as we keep defining stakeholders as those that will own the technology, 
As long as we keep separating the people that are suffering from the effects of global change and poverty from the science, technology, policy discussion, it's going to be extremely easy to have a science, technology, policy that is pervasively against a social demand, which is different. Point number four is the role of the academies. I think that Mike, uh, Professor Mike, Michael Clegg has described that. I just want to add a bit on the effect of YANAS, uh, which is the Inter-American Network of Academies of Science, in the case of Nicaragua. I don't know whether you're all aware the Nicaraguan government is building a canal. Uh, it's funny, I mean, some details are incredibly interesting. Nicaragua doesn't have diplomatic relations with China. However, a Chinese company and a company in Nicaragua are starting this month to build an interoceanic canal that will uh, link the two oceans and nobody really knows uh, what's going to happen with the ecology, with the Mesoamerican corridor for species migration, for the Atlantic to Pacific biological flux, and so forth. And the academies went to Nicaragua not to interfere into an independent government, but to raise questions. And, and I think that that is a very, very important role for the academies, to raise the fundamental questions, but to raise fundamental questions that have a very clear and solid scientific base and are stakeholder related, not only from the very technical point of view, but protecting or thinking about who is going to be affected by the scientific or technological change. I think that, that that's a good example. Uh, all this brings me to how are we going to ensure something that was in a document uh, signed by Professor Pallis about eight years ago that says every country, everybody has the right to understand what is happening in the world today when you think of science and technology. If we don't ensure scientific literacy all over the world, it's going to be extremely difficult for the people to pressure in the places where you can pressure without being, well, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, without a scientific literate world population, sustainability is a loss. And this is not a long-term project. This is as urgent as everything that has been said today because policymakers worry about voters. And if the voters don't understand what the issues are, it's going to be very difficult for the policymakers to respond to our pressures only. I want to end by agreeing totally what has been said. I'm not going to repeat, of course, that we live in a multipolar world. And it's in that world and China and the states were mentioned. But there is hope that this region, the Americas, became an actor on the global scene in not a very distant future. Certainly Brazil with the neighbors have a responsibility to come within that club because a monopolar world or a bipolar world 
still doesn't give space to this continent. And so we have a responsibility as scientists, as citizens, as informed people to make this continent an actor in a multipolar world to go and to try for a governance which is different than that that was created in 1945. Having said this, I think that this occasion is a most wonderful occasion for the academies to have the conscience of the role in a multipolar world that is not sustainable if things go the way they are. That is...